first thing I want to say is that Yeats was a big believer in symbolism. He believed that by using symbols, you could say things without actually saying them. That you could take the reader's mind to a place that they weren't even really aware you were taking them. And you can sort of modulate a signal or a meaning behind the words and act specifically and directly on the reader's subconscious rather than just consciously spouting out words that may be filtered through the uh, reader's mind in one particular way. So he saw symbolism as a sort of backdoor method. Of course, this is full of symbolism. And the first is, of course, the second coming. Here, we see the second coming and immediately you think, ah, I understand what's going to happen in this poem. It's clear. It is a religious poem written by a Christian talking about the, the end of days, the, the time under the Christian belief when Jesus is supposed to come back and the kingdom on, of earth will be ushered in and all the non-believers will not be a part of it. And you've heard that a lot. Well, this is a little bit of dramatic irony because by the time you get to the end of this, you realize he's no Christian and he's not talking about anything good happening here like like a Christian might think of the second coming. So let's start. Turning and turning in the widening gyre. Okay, I have to stop here and say turning and turning. Yates, he bought an old castle in Ireland. He was an Irish poet. He bought a great, an old castle and restored it. His um, office was at the top of the tower and you know just just up near, you know under the battlements of this ta tower up in the top and so in order to get to his office you had to wind your way around these stairs <laughs> uh, that just that, that snaked their way all around the the uh, circumference of this of this the interior circumference of this tower so I always look at these poems and his idea about gyres and things and say well you know no wonder you're you're having to get to, to do these circles all the way up to your office every time. Now let's take up the gyre, this idea of a of a gyre. Um, this comes from a revelation that Yates believed to have occurred through his wife, Miss Yates, when she was doing some automatic writing. He was big into the occult and uh, big into all of that sort of thing. And by the way, this poem was first published in The Dial, November 1920. And I think that's interesting because The Dial is the original publication of the Transcendentalists in Concord, Massachusetts. And uh, they were very much um, mystics. They believed you could sort of, you could sort of transcend this world by using your imagination and this is much like Yeats with this with his occult and the automatic writing and whatnot uh, the dial went through several uh, incarnations here it was first a transcendentalist publication and managed by Henry David Thoreau Margaret Fuller Ralph Waldo Emerson and it was a vehicle for them to publish their essays and uh, religious philosophies and then it was incarnated into a political magazine, very liberal in the, in the 1880s. And then it became one of the great modernist magazines later on in the 1920s. And uh, Yeats is in great company. Other poets who were published in this magazine in the dial were T.S. Eliot, E.E. E. Cummings, William Carlos Williams, and Ezra Pound. Back to the gyre. Yeats believes that he believed that life and your soul and every civilization can be represented by a wheel and on that wheel there are 28 spokes that correspond to the to the 28 phases of the lunar month as opposed to the to the 12 houses or constellations in the uh, astronomical wheel. This is different. This is the, he called it the great wheel. 
he believed that every soul and every civilization must pass through all 28 phases. Right? So he feels like, and, and this idea of a gyre is like a huge cone, and it is facing upward. So it's like this huge tornado-like thing on top of you, and you spiral your way up through this gyre or this cone as you move through your life, and you move through those 28 phases, and you, it has different personality types in there. Now, what's interesting is he envisions a, a an opposite gyre. So think of two cones intersecting at the at the vertex in the end and if as they move into each other the the windings of each cone they intersect each other and it's like when you're at this certain personality type you are directly co confronted with what maybe Freud later on would call your shadow shadow self he calls it your mask you're confronted with the exact opposite of yourself so here we can see an example of these two gyres as they are directly opposite and intersecting one another. Uh, in the primary gyre we see physical space and moral objective. In the antithetical gyre we see uh, spiritual time and aesthetic objectives. Now I, I kind of see this, it reminds me a little bit of Anne Bradstreet uh, and her poem Flesh and Spirit. We have the we have the physical and the spiritual. Um, this is a long idea, and and I'm not sure Yeats even understood it all, to be honest. But uh, but there it is. So we see it here in the widening gyre and the falcon. It's the gyre is widening because we are spiraling up through it as we lead our lives and and head towards the end. And the falcon. This is a sort of a double symbol here. The falcon, you have the falconeer who is controlling, it's man and beast, he's controlling this falcon, and the falcon it has, is lost as it too is spiraling upward in this gyre, or above the falconeer. Very famous line here, things fall apart. It's brilliant in its simplicity, things fall apart. It reminds me of Thomas Pynchon's great short story, Entropy. And he says, and this is a this is a real concept in physics. It's entropy, where every there is no perfect system. All systems lose energy and decay over time. That is what he's saying about society. It has lost its center just by the next uh, the next little portion here. He says the center cannot hold. What is your center? It's the well. It's the center of a circle. What is the center of a human? Well, maybe it's your moral center, it's your compass, if we're talking uh, Melville. He says, turn not thy back to the compass. But he says, thing, this is Yeats, he says, things fall apart. The center cannot hold. And that is just a perfect example of this feeling felt during modernism, where everything was falling down around them. I won't revisit all of the thoughts about the First World War, but it was certainly an awful war. And at just on the tail end of that, we had the Russian Revolution, which most people think Yeats is actually talking about when, in this poem, uh, otherwise known as the Bolshevik Revolution. Um, it was really awful in the Soviet... Well, it led to the Soviet Union. This is Russia. It, it, uh, it was a really awful time. And, and we see that in this next line, the blood-dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The blood-dimmed tide, you see this this uh, waterway, whether it's a coastline, you may, may think of D-Day, of course that's after, but you, you can think of that. Think of a river, an, uh, a, a coast, uh, a lake, any body of water where so many people have died that the blood is just dimming the water, it is pervading the water, and in that tide of blood, the ceremony of innocence is drowned. Innocence is gone. Another 
very famous line, the best lack all conviction while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Have you noticed that in life? Have you noticed that people who often have negative intentions or who are harming other people or who are just out for themselves are the loudest ones of all? Often people who are wrong are the loudest ones of all. And the best people we have, what are they doing? Well, they're sitting at home hiding because all the bad ones are so mean and spiteful and powerful and up in your face and all that. Well, the best, we we just want to go, just get away from it. Have you seen that? Apparently Yates did. Surely some revelation is at hand. Surely the second coming is at hand. Now we we says people. I I envision people kind of looking at each other, saying, "Gosh, the world is falling apart." Think that. Look at that first world war. Wow, that was terrible. And they say, "Surely the second coming is going to happen soon." And this is the shift right here. This is the moment where this poem shifts. You can see people saying, "Ah, Jesus is coming back." But here, boom. Hardly are those words out when a vast image out of Spiritus Mundi. Now this Spiritus Mundi is like a, it's the spirit world. And, and it, also, it is also described as like the, uh, like Carl Jung's collective unconscious. We have this, I, I believe this, we have human beings have this collective unconscious to where it's not anything mystical or anything like that. It's just that when you're born you have certain building blocks already available in in your mind and and you and those are those are like images like why is red scary well it's, it has to do with fire and blood and all these kind of things that's a collective thought um if you see darth vader coming you'll know he's a bad guy right off the bat why well because it's just it's ingrained in us it's okay so yates says a, a, an image comes out of that place and out of that spirit world, out of that collective storehouse of images, and it troubles his sight, and it is this. It's the Sphinx coming to life in the desert. It's like, whoa, you take a step back and say, what? I thought this was the second coming. This is supposed to be Jesus and all that. No, not not here. Not here. The Sphinx comes alive. And, and it's this beautiful imagery where you can see the Sphinx standing up, it, his gaze blank, pitiless, and it's moving its slow thighs, and you see all the, the in, not just desert birds, but indignant desert birds, a little bit of a great word choice there, and the shadows, and these birds are reeling all about this Sphinx that is coming alive. Oh, darkness, of course darkness is very symbolic we have the heart of darkness um 20 centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle and then he says and what rough beast its hour come round at last slouches towards bethlehem to be born well in the in the jewish in the ancient jewish tradition the messiah had to be born in bethlehem it was just part of the deal and Yates is describing here, in my view, some sort of some sort of antichrist. This is not a happy thing. This is not a happy second coming. I think Yates would believe that the best will just continue to lack conviction, while the worst will be will be on the ground. And uh, we see that this sphinx, this crazy image, is headed towards Bethlehem to be born. He will be the next savior demigod evil spirit whatever to to reign over the earth